Good morning and welcome to Live with Lewis for 14 October 2004. We're coming to you live today as you can see in the image on your monitors today. We're coming to you live from the shores of the Missouri River at Fort Yates on the Standing Rock Sioux Indian Reservation. Uh, we are approximately halfway between uh, Bis excuse me, Bismarck, North Dakota and Mobridge, South Dakota. Mobridge, South Dakota is where we came to you from uh, last time and uh, we're, we're uh, going to be talking today with the chairman of the Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribe, uh, Chairman Charles Murphy. We'll be joined by him in just a few moments. As always, uh, we want to welcome all of our internet viewers and uh, those uh, school students and teachers and educators that are in the audience today, as well as our regular Lewis and Clark audience that's following us as we make our way along the river with the Discovery Expedition. On behalf of the School District of Clayton and the Discovery Expedition, once again, welcome to Live with Lewis. Today is the 14th of October, 2000. And, four. and as I mentioned, we are in Fort Yates, North Dakota. Actually, we are in Fort Yates Standing Rock uh, Reservation, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. To get a little bit of our business out of the way, uh, we encourage you to send us your comments and questions during today's broadcast at Lewis and Clark, L E W I S A N D C L A R K, Lewis and Clark, all spelled out, at Clayton, C L A Y T O N. Dot k12 dot mo dot us that's lewis and clark at clayton dot k12 dot mo dot us and we'll be eager to take your uh, online uh, questions and comments during today's program and answer those during the broadcast if we have time and otherwise we'll try to get to them immediately and we'll answer you via email uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are at what is currently known as Fort Yates, the community of Fort Yates on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit, as always, about what happened to the original expedition 200 years ago. Uh, since we saw you last, and we were down actually at a place called Swan Creek, and that's going to figure prominently into our conversation, I think, a little bit later today as well. We were at Swan Creek, South Dakota. <clears throat> we talked about the fact that at that point, the original expedition was starting to cross between two cultures there, leaving uh, some of the Sioux uh, culture, the, the Lakota culture that they had been moving through for some time and who were moving into the area inhabited by the Arikara. And we'll be uh, seeing some footage of, of some of the areas we've moved through here. Uh, the original expedition was uh, starting to pass into the land of the Arikara, as well as, uh, uh, that was, it was an interesting area there. There were both Arikara communities as well as Sioux communities uh, intermingled, and the the journals of Lewis and Clark record their interactions with both the Arikara people as well as the the uh, part of the the Tetuan band of the Sioux that were were further north uh, along the river at that time. Some of the interesting things that we note at that point is after having uh, moved through for quite some time the Lakota culture, which was a culture largely based upon uh, a bu it was a buffalo culture, and we talked a great deal about the role of the buffalo in the Sioux culture. We start to move into the Arikara culture where we see more of an agricultural uh, community. We uh, see in the journals the recording of such things as the large amount of produce and agriculture that the that the Arikara have and the expedition was trading a great deal with those communities for those staples of, uh, of squash and beans and uh, the produce that was uh, indigenous to this area and that those folks cultivated on a regular basis. One of the things that we've talked about so much as we've made our way along this trip is the diversity of cultures here in North America, the aboriginal cultures, and it's interesting uh, oftentimes we forget that many of these cultures did have an agricultural component to them as well. The Arikara, like the Hidatsa Mandan, uh, we're very much engaged in, in agricultural uh, production, and uh, that will be a part of the story as we continue on. The expedition uh, traded a great deal, and indeed the Arikara themselves uh, were uh, known among the Indian people for the produce that they produced, and would often, uh, that, that produce that they uh, grew in their communities was often part of, very much part of the trade network between themselves and other tribes that they interacted with here in their homeland. Uh, as I mentioned, the journals are pretty replete at this point and filled with uh, with references to the Arikara. They start to note the difference in the in the lodges that the Arikara people live in. They are uh, largely earth lodge dwellers, a more permanent culture than the Lakota, who uh, were somewhat nomadic, traveling and following the buffalo herds. And the Arikara uh, lodges, unlike the Lakota or Sioux 
uh, lodges, which were often teepees that were uh, mobile. These earth lodges were more permanent structures, and while not quite as large as some of the ones that Lewis and Clark would encounter with the Hidatsa Mandan, uh, basically the same type of construction. Oftentimes, the journal records the villages of being somewhere from 40 to 60 or 80 of these lodges closely constructed near one another with a stockade uh, fence around these communities. Um, and uh, both for defense as well as it's been communicated to us in some instances to protect them from not simply uh, other uh, tribal insurgents or, or someone who might attack them, uh, humans, but also sometimes to keep uh, animals out of the immediate area of the village as well. And so we'll see some footage of earth lodges and we'll see a great deal uh, more about earth lodges and those earth lodge communities as we move north. What we'd like to do at this time is take a look at the footage that uh, we've collected over the last week since we saw you last, and we're going to go to that footage now. Jim? And here you see us leaving Swan Creek. As we talked about Swan Creek, Swan Creek was a, a real introduction to us about what's happening on the Upper Missouri River. And here you see us leaving the Swan Creek area. And as you can see, the tops of trees exposed here because Lake Oahe is down. This reservoir that is called Lake Oahe on the Missouri River uh, is, is down very, very low. And you saw there the tops of trees as we moved out into the river. And here you see the boats uh, moving into Mobridge. One of the things that happened in Mobridge is you see here some National Guard boats that recently returned from Iraq. And they move into Mobridge uh, f with us as we move into the Mobridge area for some of the events that were taking place there. The 200th, which is the local South Dakota National Guard unit, just re returned from South Dakota or from Iraq, and we're proud to to uh, to recognize the efforts of the South Dakota National Guard. And here you see the keelboat, and a quite beautiful picture as it makes its way into Indian Creek Recreation Area near Mobridge, South Dakota. And we were going to be moored here for several days during the. Uh, the events uh, surrounding the uh, bicentennial there uh, for several days and you see the keelboat making its way into that safe harbor there and the winds were quite high we've been unable to use the tenting on the large boat because of the high winds and of course we're gonna uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the winds throughout today but uh, this is a, a very very windy part of the country and the winds here are famous in their own right uh, they, they play a large part in the in the in the life of all the people who live here today, uh, the, when you listen to the weather here, the wind is as much a part of that as anything. One of the events going on was uh, actually a number of events taking place at the Chicago Rail Learning Center in Mobridge, and here you see Kevin Locke, a very well-known uh, uh, Lakota hoop dancer and flute player, and he's actually here conducting a hoop dance uh, seminar with. Uh, young people as well as some of our members who joined them for that, uh, that, that seminar there as part of the events going on. And here you see uh, some of our members uh, interacting with uh, the public uh, and doing some teaching uh, about some of the Lewis and Clark perspective on the trip uh, at the Chicago Rail Learning Center. We've had beautiful weather during those days of the event there. And uh, there's uh, Jay Jones and here you see Pete McGee actually sharing a, a sign language uh, presentation. Maybe we can go to the audio on this. Here, two, days. From now, first thing you need, you go in front of the men. And what you saw Pete doing there was a sign language presentation. Pete, of course, is uh, speaks to the story of uh, of George Duyard, the uh, sign talker, the the Shawnee and French interpreter who was traveling with them. And uh, one of the other uh, things that took place in Mobridge is this is the third time we've been joined by members of the Stop Lewis and Clark. Uh, organization. These are folks who are speaking out of, about the, uh, the Eurocentric perspective that has been largely the, the, uh, the, the only voice that has been heard during this bicentennial. And here's Victor Camp, who is uh, one of the leaders of that, that movement, trying to bring awareness to Native American issues. And they've been joining us at a number of the events and will continue to do so as we move across the country as they speak out about uh, their concerns about uh, the, the failure of America to sometimes understand the Native American perspective on what this expedition and subsequent military and governmental actions meant for this area. One of the things that's interesting about this particular area of the country is so much history is, is converged in this area. Uh, both the Native American Aboriginal histories of the people who called this land home for many, many centuries before any Europeans arrived here. And what we see here is just a large number of monuments around this area 
with Sitting Bull. This is one to, uh, that commemorates Nathaniel Pryor's expedition that was a failed expedition to return some of the uh, the Native Americans, including uh, the Mandan chief who made his way to Washington back to their village. Um, this area played such an important part in American history on so many different levels, and the area is just full of monuments uh, to different pieces of, of history, both Native and non-Native, and uh, there's a uh, Here's an earth lodge, one of the earth lodges that is on display at the Chicago Whale Learning Center and demonstrating the type of traditional housing that was used by the Ricker in this area. Uh, we learn a great deal in this area about the story of the Lakota, the Arikara, as well as the early uh, white settlement and the conflicts in many cases between these cultures as they clashed. This is footage of inside of a reconstructed fort, Fort Manuel, which was a fort named after Manuel Lisa, who was the Spanish trader from St. Louis that played such a large part in the fur trade and the politics of this period all along the Missouri River. This is a reconstructed fort that now sits on a hill above the area where the original fort once did sit, and we'll see that area down below here. There you see the reconstructed sentry post on the top. This was not a military post. This was a trading post. And there out in that field, in that, uh, that lowland there by the river is where that original fortification originally stood. And that was a French, actually a, a fur trading post there ran by Manuel Lisa, the trader from St. Louis. And uh, as you can see, much of the water is down and there's, there's a great deal of exposed land down there. Um, here we are at the Chicago Era, uh, Monument that is near Mobridge, and this is actually one of several monuments to Chicago Era in different locations. As we've talked about before, there is some uh, dispute about where her remains actually are, where she actually died. Um, in addition to that, we're going to see in this area several monuments dedicated to Sitting Bull, who is believed to be buried in a location near here. And as you can see, the beautiful rolling hills uh, they're behind the Sitting Bull Monument. And uh, this area, again, is, is while it is stark by uh, maybe eastern standards with regard to the lack of trees in this area, it is just a beautiful, beautiful landscape here. And we'll have an opportunity to see much more of that. And here we are at Fort Yates, at the Sitting Bull Monument at Fort Yates, where we're broadcasting to you live from today. And there you see the, uh, the spear which is, this is a beautiful monument there, the spear that's, uh, that's in the ground there at that monument. And uh, here's uh, part of that Sitting Bull monument, uh, Tatanke Iontanke. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, that's right. And I'm being joined right now by, by Chairman Murphy and uh, Tatanke Iontanke, which is uh, the Sitting Bull's name in Lakota. And uh, so here we are in the background. You see the tribal uh, council building, the administrative offices for the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. And uh, we are going to be joined here in just a moment by Chairman Charles Murphy, who is the tribal chairman for the uh, Fort Yates community and, and f indeed for all of the Standing Rock Reservation. Uh, first of all, Chairman Murphy, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us this morning, taking time out. I know you're in the middle of a, of a council session right now, and, but again, thank you for joining us this morning. Well, first of all, I want to thank you to Standing Rock. Uh, Standing Rock is, is in two parts of the states. It's in South Dakota and North Dakota. But, you know, uh, as, as you're coming up the river here, uh, again, uh, we have Lakota, uh, Nakota, uh, uh, Dakota people and uh, Yankton A up here. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, eight, res eight eight districts right now. We have five in South Dakota, uh, three in North Dakota. Fort Yates is the headquarters uh, of the Standing Rock Reservation. And this this reservation, when Lewis and Clark went through, I mean, we had all the land, but now they put us on 2.3 million acres, and that's all we have left. And, and uh, but. I, I just want to welcome you here, uh, passing through, and, and uh, looking forward to you guys coming through uh, 06, I guess. Well, thank you very much, and, and I know that you're going to have to leave us in a few minutes and return to actually doing business right now. Um, one of the things that uh, is, is very important here, and we're going to talk about this with some other folks today, but uh, obviously we were all very disappointed. Um, and it, although our disappointment really is, is inconsequential, one of the things that I'll share with our audience is that we're actually having to trailer the boats around Fort Yates. And the reason for that is because of the, the, the situation with the water. And we've talked about this for several weeks with our audience about the fact that uh, while there 
it's very interesting that you know there were no dams on the river when Lewis and Clark came by and in many instances uh, when people here in South Dakota North Dakota talk about the water levels being low they're still much higher than when Lewis and Clark came through although the river itself has uh, has has different uh, physical features now because of what the, the installation of the dams both above here and below here have done and so right now while we talk about the water being low by comparison to the reservoirs in some places it's still high higher than when Lewis and Clark came through but right here at Standing Rock you have some very very serious concerns with regard to water issues yes we do uh, and back in uh, right before a week before Thanksgiving uh, our water system happened to go down uh, and uh, what has happened is that the main intake uh, was way back here and now we had to go out almost a, a almost a half a mile to get out to water out in the main channel and uh, left us with uh, about 10,000 people without water and, and uh, even today uh, we're still having problems because of the silting and so forth that we have a so-called intake uh, down uh, down south here but what's happening is it, that intake is, is uh, silting in because of the water movement uh, we had experts out of Minneapolis come over here and, and tell us how, how what's what's going on with the issue and so forth but uh, it's falling on deaf ears in DC someplace so well, and it's been an issue all along the river. When we were, I, just a few weeks ago, I was in Lower Brule, and there was a uh, conference down there, a symposium actually called Surviving Lewis and Clark, and I had the opportunity to uh, listen to a, a panel of uh, folks, representatives of the different tribes along the river, talking about issues. And, and I mean, personally, I, I was really struck by how dire situation it is here. In fact, I think it was communicated there that given the current situation that even with the extension of the water intake out here that there's still some concern about the next eight to twelve months about uh, about the water supply which is, this is the primary water supply for the community isn't it? That's correct that's correct and uh, like I said we have three communities on this particular line and uh, whatever happens uh, if we don't have water here if we don't bring it in we'll have three communities with over ten thousand people that are on this line and uh, we could be sitting here without water come December too and it is a serious issue, and I hope that uh, for the educators and students that are in the audience today, and just for all of the concerned folks who are who are following our broadcast, that you'll take the time to learn more about these water issues, because as we have always stated, uh, the the purpose of this project is much more than simply reviewing things in a historical perspective, but to look at very contemporary issues and while these issues that Chairman Murphy mentions today are, are extremely uh, important here on this reservation here to this community the issues associated with water levels are affecting native and non-native communities up and down the river and it's truly a cause for concern for all Americans because it, if it impacts one of us it impacts all of us in some fashion and I would encourage our educators to to take their students uh, to other websites which we will probably in include on ours through links and things but to find out more about this issue because this is an issue which has national significance to all of us. Chairman, I'd also like to ask you a little bit about the, the community. I know we're, we're going to let you go and talk to some other folks in a few moments, but uh, w one of the things that I have also been very, very impressed with, um, and one of the things that we talk with our audience about is life on reservations today and that sort of thing. Um, I, I really wanted to just express as someone who, as an outsider who's traveling across the country and visiting the different reservations, uh, here in Fort Yates, it's, it's just amazing to me the commitment that this community has made to infrastructure issues, to education. Uh, I've seen not only the, the fine schools you have here, um, but but as well, the, the, you've got some ongoing construction. There's been a real commitment in the community to infrastructure, hasn't there? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and uh, we have we we done it to all eight districts, including 48s, and and uh, we're we're redoing that. For, for I guess for the last hundred years, uh, since they put us on a reservation, what we have been doing is uh, making home improvements, making road improvements, and, and a lot of this stuff here. We have we have a lot of individuals that are working uh, or that have jobs today. We also have we have two casinos that uh, we, we don't make that much money because the population is not there, but. It helps. It help us get by with some of the issues that we're dealing with today, and uh, but again, I, I just wanted to go back to the river just for one second. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, at one time when I was, uh, uh, I'm 50 some years old, but I remember when we had a lot of trees here. You know, and uh, but I, I never ever seen this water like this here. You know, I mean, when they flooded it, uh, even when my grandfather was on the council, he said. 
uh, he wanted to take this out to the people before they flooded it. And what happened is that they flooded it anyway. You know, they come in here and, and uh, did what they wanted to do. And, and now today, uh, now today we're dealing with uh, we're de dealing with uh, state legislators and senators and everything else, and particularly down river over three barges. You know, I mean, uh, they have three barges down in the state of uh, Missouri that uh, I know that that's where you guys originated from, but. But the thing is, is that, that those barges, uh, they, the guy said they lost $7 million. But the thing was is that I had 10,000 people over, over probably uh, 10,000 or $10 million worth, worth of, worth of uh, uh, problems I had here in, in November. But uh, they say that they lost $7 million. But, you know, versus a barge versus uh, the, the, the people on the reservation that need water, I mean, uh, human... Uh, Human consumption was no, wasn't important, I guess. Well, it seems that we're hearing a lot of the same along the river, uh, you know, about concerns about the river and the management of the river. And I, I, I don't know. Maybe one of the things, if nothing else, that we can can bring as good news to you is that the conversations being had, and it sounds. Uh, from my perspective, as someone essentially acting as, a, as an observer and reporter moving along the way here, that uh, it sounds like you may have a, you, you may be finding if, if the communication uh, network is extended along the river, it sounds like there's a lot of people with the same concerns all the way up and down the river, and, and perhaps as people start to talk and dialogue about this, uh, uh, you know, the, you'll be able to affect some change uh, for the good all along the river, we hope. Well, I thank you, and I appreciate you uh, listening to us, and I hope that some Somebody would pick up on this and, and uh, give us a little bit of support on what's happening to this river. You know. Well, thank you much. We we appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. We're going to see you inside in a little bit. Uh, when we're after the broadcast, we're going to join you inside the council chambers. Again, I appreciate you coming out today, and thank you so much, and thank you for your hospitality here on Standing Rock. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yep. The uh, the next person that we're going to be joined by today is uh, is a gentleman who's also a council member here on the reservation, gentleman. Uh, Excuse me. And go ahead. We're being joined by uh, Frank Big Elk. Frank White Bull. I, I'm sorry, Frank White Bull. I'm, I'm talking to so many different people here today, and so I apologize. Uh, Mr. Fr uh, White Bull, uh, you're a council chairman, or excuse me, you're a council member here at uh, Standing Rock. Welcome very much, and we're going to talk to you about something very specific. Um, you're from down in Kennel, is that correct? Yes, I am. Now, Kennel is a community, I, what, about 30 miles south of here, 20, 30 miles south of here, I guess? Yeah, you could say something like that. And w for those of you who are watching the, the introduction footage there, you, you may have seen we talked about Fort Manuel, which was a, a trading post uh, that was located here um, on, the, uh, on what is now the reservation. Of course, it wasn't a reservation at that time. And uh, it was run by a man by the name of Manuel Lisa, who was from St. Louis. In fact, Lewis had written about Manuel Lisa and his dealings with him over the winter of 0304 prior to the expedition leaving the St. Louis area. Uh, Manuel Lisa was a very prominent individual with regard to trade along the river, a very powerful man, and he built uh, a number of trading posts along the way, including the one uh, known as Fort Manuel. Uh, in near near the present reconstruction near now what is kennel on the Standing Rock Reservation here and Frank if you could tell us a little bit about the efforts of your community to reconstruct that and, and even a little bit about the history of that of that uh, site well it was approximately two years ago we started uh, planning on this um, uh, uh, you know our site there Fort Manuel replica um, our planning local planning commission uh, some ideas came up you know we we, we you heard the stories amongst our elders back home there that um, uh, you know the site, the, rep the the actual site was down there, and you hear a lot of stories, um, different various stories um, from that location there. So that's uh, we looked at the area of tourism and the area of the interest of coming along in the Standing Rock within Standing Rock a reservation. I believe that's one of the major uh, after the fact of the uh, expedition, come back and then do the trade trade post so. We, we come and planned and, and we made it, uh, we opened it last year, 2003, July in 2003, we, um, we, uh, o we officially opened uh, the replica and uh, since then have been open and um, we employ, we look at the economics from it, uh, the history, uh, we looked at the history in, the, in our area. Uh, I know there's different views on the history of it, but um, we just look at it from, um, uh, economic standpoint, uh, hiring our own people and the construction of it, and now employing people with uh, our own people with with uh, r uh, operation day to day of it, um, and that's where we're looking at uh, 
uh, it's going to be there forever, I think, in my mind, where we're at right now. It, it's open to the public, and Kennel's about, what, uh, 20 miles north of Mobridge, roughly? Yeah, roughly about 25 miles north of Mobridge. Uh, it's pretty much equal from 48 here. It's 25 miles south. And and for those who are, for those of you who might be watching today's broadcast, who are considering traveling along this route, if you get to Mobridge, South Dakota, and you go you cross the river to the west side of the river and take Highway 1806 north, it will lead you right past uh, the place. As soon as just as you're entering the town of Kennel, uh, it's located on the right hand side. There's a big sign there that uh, that tells a story. Tell us a little bit. Of, uh, and my understanding is the the original fort was built in was 1812 or something. Yeah, um, it was back then, 1812 there, and um, I, I believe it was for like uh, seven or nine months, um, actual construction or the the life of it, and uh, it was burnt down. Uh, and in, in, and burned down uh, by the the indigenous people who lived around there, who had who had, I guess did not uh, see eye to eye with Manuel Lewis, uh, Luisa rather. Well, yeah, there's different views back then too, you know. Um, for what happened there and and looking at it from that standpoint of view um uh what we look at it today is that again um there's two different ways we look at this and and one way we look at it is from a, a tourism part of it you know being part of the expedition of these years 200 years here past from 2003 all the way up how far it goes i don't know you know 2006 you know ongoing and then the other view is our um our, our 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 way as Lakotas, you know, um, and then looking at it from that standpoint of view. So there's two different views of that we look at, and I could get, get more in depth on it. But I kind of running on time here. Sure. Meetings are coming up here and all that. But um, you know, in Kennel, we we looked at that, and then we were promoting that uh, our tourism. We had T-shirts for sale, um, uh, brochures out. Uh, we're on a website www. Kennel dot O R G. It's one L one N K E N E L dot O R G. Um, information's on there. Um, we will link to that. Yes, and and um, uh, so a lot of input's been put into it for verbally and you know physically too. You know, part as far as construction of it. Uh, and uh, our saying in Kennel is the word the sun shines first in Standing Rock. So, <laughs> what? thank you. What, that's well, thank you so much. And I'll tell you, just for whatever it's worth, uh, Meriwether Lewis wasn't a big fan of Manuel Lisi either. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks right. so much, sir. I appreciate you taking the time. I think we're going to be uh, joined by uh, one other gentleman here in just a moment who's with uh, Historic Preservation for Standing Rock and for the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Could you introduce yourself for our audience? Yes. Uh, actually, my name is Jesse taken alive and I'm on the tribal government as well uh, the other individual that we had hoped to have had here mr. Tim Mintz is out on travel today but uh, uh, nevertheless I'm glad to be here thank you so much for taking the time and if you could explain to us as well you know uh, when I spoke with LaDonna uh, Ellard earlier she mentioned that you were with the uh, uh, historic preservation for the tribe can you tell us a little bit exactly what that means and, and what it is uh, you do for the tribe in that regard well, first let me introduce myself uh, in a manner that I always try to do publicly, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. But, uh, I wanted to say that uh, to preface any comments that I make, and essentially what I said is that uh, uh, my name is uh, uh, Jesse Taken Alive, and my, my Indian name, of course, is Taken Alive as well. And uh, in our language, I, I said that I want to give everybody a, horn, a warm, hearty, felt handshake uh, this afternoon as I've been asked to uh, offer some comments and to let people know that while this expedition is, is being reenacted, it provides us an opportunity to talk about our viewpoints, our views with regard to what happened way back then, uh, what has happened since, and what is happening right now. So essentially that's what the, the crux of my comics, comments were, and I, I want to make certain that 
that I uh, can t tell these in a simple and truthful and honest manner, as we've been taught to do as indigenous people of, uh, of uh, the United States of America. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that I, I respect this opportunity and that uh, it, it provides us a, a mechanism to allow the world to not freeze us, if you will, and romanticize us in the past. We do have a beautiful culture. Uh, my colleague uh, is very much involved with his work down in Kennel, uh, South Dakota, and that just exemplifies the um, the uh, resiliency that we have as indigenous people to come through all of the things that history has uh, brought us through, uh, diseases, uh, all kinds of acts of genocide, but yet they're able to, to demonstrate that they, they still have respect. We still have respect for, for other cultures, and we'll always have that. Um, so that's a testimony to that, uh, what the uh, t tiny community of Kettle is doing, and, and we're very proud of them and all the work that they do. But yes, we do have a story to tell, uh, and we want to make certain that we do it in a most honest and simple way, uh, because when the expedition took place here, many of us believe that it was the start of uh, uh, genocidal practices. It was a start of, of uh, accessing lands. Uh, it was a start of many things of that nature. However, we as indigenous people uh, uh, didn't view it at, at that time in that manner. Uh, we welcomed uh, the visitors as we, as we always do. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, history will show that uh, uh, the treaty making process started. And it's important to know that that treaty making process is one of the United States of America. It's not one of the indigenous peoples of the uh, of, uh, United States. And uh, we all know what history will show that you know, all the treaties were broken. What's even more troubling about it is that uh, once uh, uh, the United States in 1871 stopped its treaty making process, then they started enacting acts of Congress. Um, and it's important to know that the Act of 1871 uh, did not uh, abrogate or, or make null and void the treaties that were in place. However, the United States, by these acts of, uh, that they took in their own government, uh, began to, to start taking all kinds of land, all kinds of human uh, and uh, natural resources from indigenous peoples. And, and all the while, our people uh, were upholding those, those treaties, th those uh, uh, laws of the land, as they're, as they're often called. And of course, the Supreme Court said it's a supreme law of the land the treaties are so we take a look at that and, and we right here in front of us the, the Missouri River uh, how it was changed the channel was changed uh, uh, because of the uh, 1944 flood control uh, act and how we uh, saw our communities flooded out and just just recently December of, of 2003 how we ran out of water how ironic and, and these are human rights violations that occurred one to see our, our uh, communities and relatives and friends forcibly moved from their from the communities as well as homes along the river and then uh, a few short years later you know 40 some years later uh, actually 40 years later almost 40 43 years later or so uh, math is escaping me right now but to see them go without water I mean these are human rights violations that uh, that need to be told uh, along with our history we've been able to come through all of these things but uh, uh, like I say uh, acts of Congress um, continually taking and taking uh, usurping uh, diminishing uh, our rights to our natural resources and the right to use them uh, and our human remains that surface along the river beds are a testimony to that. Uh, they're there to continue to remind us and to help us in a spiritual sense uh, of things that we need to do to preserve our homelands for our upcoming children our, and grandchildren and as our, our grand ancestors said, those yet born. So you know, you know, we, we want to take this opportunity to tell our story. In fact, there's a young group of folks that come out of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation that follow the expedition and, and tell of these tales, tell of these these facts, if you will, of what did actually happen. And uh, we want to, uh, of course, do it again, not to be redundant and respectful, but in an honest way to to America, and especially right now with uh, with the election time. You know, uh, the United States of America is going to be e electing a new president, and of course, we've got a uh, senatorial races going on. So we've been uh, asking uh, those uh, uh, that are going to be seated, uh, whether they're incumbents or their rivals, uh, their questions and their positions, positions, if you will, about treaties, 
because they are the supreme law of the land and right now they're not being upheld and we we know that the, the common uh, response to our positions is that while those are old uh, the Indians should forget that should go on with life well uh, those uh, documents those real estate documents uh, are based off of the United States Constitution and we know the Constitution is, is far older if you will than these treaties are and uh, like I said earlier uh, they're still the supreme law of the land until otherwise uh, negotiated by the Indian nations and the United States themselves so uh, there's a lot to tell uh, but nevertheless I really do appreciate this opportunity to share this much of it um, letting the world know uh, our our saga if you will letting the world know that we are attempting and will continue to attempt to work with the united nations where these matters should be taken up because we do know uh, that the united states is trying to make these a domestic issue and that's not fair that's not right at all to do that uh, so that way our our message to the world will be uh, diminished somewhat but we do know that th these are international issues that we talk about and we'll continue to respect the United States of America. Uh, prime example of that is the number of young people that uh, defend these homelands to the armed services. Uh, and a lot of people, as we speak, uh, uh, equate what went on and what goes on with us uh, to what goes on right now in Iraq. You know, and we often look at ourselves and are beginning to describe what happened to us as being colonized. A lot of history will say, well, they were overrun. Uh, uh, the United States overtook these, these, uh, these Indian tribes. That's not the case at all. We respected those treaties. And for whatever reason, however they did it, uh, they went ahead and, and, and changed them within their own uh, government, that, that being the United States. So you know, I just wanted to say that much about, about what goes on here presently. Uh, this is an excellent opportunity to, to offer these things that we do appreciate this, this opportunity that you've that you afforded to us. And uh, we do have a beautiful history and culture. In fact, we have all the ingredients that make up nations with the only exception of one ingredient and that is currency. <laughs> we don't have currency and it's sometimes that's probably a, a good thing I would imagine. Uh, but all the other ingredients, uh, history, culture, land-based language, uh, uh, government, uh, not necessarily the Indian Organization Act of 1934 government that I'm a member of, but uh, traditional forms of government. A lot of our young people are wanting us to, to uh, re-examine those, re-institute those, uh, and uh, decolonize ourselves, if you will, uh, to what ha has occurred to us uh, as far as uh, American American Indians or, or, or uh, Native Americans or indigenous people, we often uh, uh, like to call ourselves out here Lakota, Dakota or Nakota peoples. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for, for uh, those words and I think we may have a couple of internet questions and I'm going to try to, to uh, okay. All right, well, I'm going to tell you, we're going to answer some of these, these questions uh, because of the short time we have. We'll answer these questions that we have regarding uh, from our Internet audience online with our, uh, via the emails and all. We're about at the end of today's broadcast. This is a short broadcast. We're actually going to be doing a second broadcast uh, when we're finished here, a curriculum-based broadcast, a video conference here at Standing Rock, where some of these issues will be continue to be discussed. And I just want to say to you, sir, thank you so much um, uh, for taking the time, and, and uh, we appreciate your candor. And uh, the conversation and the thoughts that you just shared with us are exactly why we're here. It's so important that Americans, the general population of America, understand uh, both historically as well as in a contemporary sense uh, what Native peoples uh, have endured and continue to endure and it's uh, I, I have been so privileged to have the opportunity over the last several months to be in the uh, in the traditional homeland of the Sioux Nation and it gives me great pride to to have uh, been here and to have an opportunity to spend time with the Dakota Nakota and Lakota people and again sir I thank you for the time you've taken to join us today and it's been my honor and my pleasure and for all the young people out there not only of indigenous uh, um, uh, race, but all the young people, and I share the, with our young people in our communities that as we work with the corporate government of the United States of America, we probably don't have the money that it takes to get involved with a lot of things to influence uh, 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 change with money. Uh, recently, we're, we're experiencing our, our opportunity to vote and how that's impacting, for example, the, the Senate race in the state of South Dakota. But I tell our young people that regardless of what it may seem, the odds may seem against us but we have the truth 
we have the truth and uh, that's all we want you know to share and want to carry on to keep that simple and we know that truth uh, can be distorted and twisted with the the legal minds out there but i tell our young people just you know continue to walk with that truth as our ancestors did ancestors did uh, so that's a message i want to share to all of our all of our young people out there regardless of race color or creed that the truth should and the truth will always prevail and that's what we uh that's what we're going to hang on to out here uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, until we see you next time on behalf of the live with lewis broadcasts each week uh, we are going to proceed on and from standing rock reservation at the community of fort yates i say dog shake <laughs>